people, people often ask me what brought me to Monterey, and my answer is always the same, the universe. I thought I was moving here to be closer to a client, but my higher purpose had another reason. It needed me to be in the container of love and positive energy that Monterey is to save my life. I knew somehow if I had not listened to that inner voice and moved in September of 2018, I would have been dead by December. I was in a really dark place. And on the surface, it looked like I had a great life. I didn't know how I had gotten there, and I couldn't see a path forward. And it made me think, if my family and friends had to deal with me taking my life, how would they have made sense of my purpose for doing it? How would they have connected the dots to give them some semblance of understanding? And I've had to ask myself that question a number of times. I know that the first dot was set in place on July 28, 1967, when I forced my way into the world five weeks early, only to find myself trapped in an incubator until I finished baking. But that was to give my mother, the mother that I was intended to have, Francis Champion, a time to get through the adoption process. In November of 1967, she became one of 28 black women and one man who were able to adopt as single parents in California. My mom made history and never talked about it. I didn't find out until after she'd passed away. Instead, she focused on making sure that I had everything that I needed growing up. She taught me to be comfortable in my skin. She created a diverse world for me so that I wasn't uncomfortable being the only black person in the room or the tallest or the weirdest or the loudest, which is why I can walk into rooms as, as if I own them. She wanted me to understand that I belonged anywhere I wanted to be or could afford to be and that our money spends green just like everybody else's. And she made sure that I knew the only way to be successful in life was to speak my mind with loving kindness, to ask for what I wanted, and to know that the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. I understood why my mom held me accountable, sometimes publicly and embarrassingly and shamelessly on her part, because it helped me grow into the person I am today. But as you probably all know, as teenagers, we don't see what's right in front of us. So in my early 20s, I was living in LA. I had a dead-end job. <laughs> I'd graduated from high school at 16. Actually, it wasn't a dead-end job at that time. I graduated from high school at 16, and I went to the NAACP. Um, there was a secretarial program they had, and I became a receptionist. And after about three months, I realized that this isn't going to work for me. I have more to offer. So I went to the CEO and asked if I could have more work. And he partnered me up with the bookkeeper. And after about six months, I was like, oh, I want to be a book, uh, an accountant. So I decided to join the Navy so that I could get a, get a college degree. And well, I got the GI Bill. And I didn't get the GI Bill, rather, I'm sorry. And um, things didn't work out quite the way that I wanted. But one of the things I got out of being in the Navy was learning that I was a natural leader. I was the RCPO, Recruit Chief Petty Officer, and I was in charge of the women in my platoon. And it helped me understand that leadership isn't about me. It's about the people that I'm leading. So when I came back home with all this newfound leadership knowledge, I thought I could get a job in leadership. And of course, without a college degree, I was told no. And so I had a bunch of dead-end jobs. This is where the dead-end jobs come in. I had a bunch of dead-end jobs with toxic leaders. And I had a dead-end relationship. And I was partying all the time. And then I got evicted from my apartment because I foolishly went shopping with my rent money, trying to keep up with LA fashion. And I only had to have that happen to me once. That never happened again. But I realized that there was more to life. And I wasn't living in the, in the way that I should have been living. I didn't know what it was. So I went to visit my cousin one weekend in the Bay Area. 
and I was driving across the Bay Bridge, and it was the clearest day imaginable, and I could see all the bridges from Golden Gate all the way down to Dumbarton. And something in my spirit said, this is where we're supposed to be. And the next night I went out to a nightclub and I met these amazing upwardly mobile black folk who didn't care who I was wearing or what I was driving. They wanted to know who I was and what I was gonna bring to the world and what I knew about the African diaspora and our history and what we meant to the world, not based on uni United States standards, but who we were in the world. And I was like, this is, this is my tribe. So I went home and packed up my car, quit my job and moved up to Oakland. And in Oakland, I found my creativity and sense of community. I realized that even though I had a job that I didn't necessarily like because, I, again, I had found a job where I had a toxic leader, I had this tribe of people that kept me going and I found other things to do to keep me inspired. I became a stand-up comedian for a little while doing uh, open mics at different places. And then I found the acting bug and I was in an acting school for a while and then became part of the Oakland Ensemble Theater. Did everything except the role I was supposed to be as understudy because I happen to be working with a diva, but we won't go there, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> and I, re I met and married my husband and he had a computer and I was fascinated with computers because it was, it was, I've always been fascinated with um, e electronics, and I decided to take his computer apart one day. And I left the pieces in the floor in the office, and he came home and said, why is my computer in parts? And I said, because that's going to be my next job. And I took it apart and put it back together and took it apart and put it back together. Then I took it apart and labeled all the pieces and put it back together, and then I bought a book called The Computer Bible, and I read it from cover to cover. In about six months, I knew I was ready. So I quit my job and I applied for a job at the help desk at Bank of America because I knew if I got the interview, I'd get the job. I just needed to get through the interview. And I got my first job at the help desk at Bank of America's trading floor. And I was ready to take off. And then my mom died and my world fell apart. And I didn't know how to navigate how I was feeling or even talk through it. And I kind of went through, this, through, the, through life kind of in this fugue state, and I couldn't get out of bed for about three weeks. And I had a dream toward the end of that third week where I saw my mother lying in bed between my husband and I dead. And when I woke up the next morning, I realized that she was there because that was a message to not let her death get between me and my husband or stop my life. So I got back to, into my work. I consulted. I did all sorts of things. I worked my way up from the help desk to the network operations manager for San Francisco's 911 system, and then I became the client services manager for Bayer Pharmaceuticals. But all along the way, I was dealing with toxic leaders. I couldn't understand why people couldn't just let the people that they hired do the job. And I decided that I had actually accomplished a goal that I hadn't even realized I accomplished. Because when I graduated high school, my aunt told me if I didn't get a job, I mean, if I didn't get a college degree, I would never make any money. And what I realized was that she had planted a seed in my head, because telling me I can't do something, you might as well tell me not to, not to, if you tell me not to do it or that I can't do it, then I'm gonna prove you wrong. But what I realized is I was chasing the money and not necessarily doing work that I actually loved that was gonna be meaningful and helpful to someone else. And so when my boss's boss flew all the way from Pittsburgh to Berkeley to tell me that my coworker found me intimidating, that was it. I had heard that word so much that intimidating to me felt like I looked like Shrek to people. Like, that was it. I quit my job and I went back to school and got my degree. I got my bachelor's in English at Mills College and my master's in writing, because I figured if I'm gonna get a degree, it's gonna be in something I enjoy, and I've always enjoyed reading and writing and all the things about communicating. And it was at Mills that my creativity was unleashed, and I was able to step into a part of me that I had never seen before as a photographer and a writer, and I started a novel. And 
the novel was my thesis, and my thesis committee said, you have to finish this book, you have to get it out in the world. And so I picked up the phone and called my aunt and uncle and asked, can I come live with you so I can finish my book? And they said yes. And so I moved to Chicago. And in Chicago in 2008, I knew that I wasn't going to take another job that wasn't going to satisfy me. And what I had discovered in all the things that I had done is that when I was teaching someone, it made me the happiest. So I applied for a job at Chicago State University, and I got an adjunct professor role, and I was teaching English and writing. And then I applied for a Harlem Renaissance class at Columbia College, and I was teaching there. And I was educating these young minds and helping them develop and find their voice and recognize where their place is in the world. Meanwhile, I was living in a studio apartment, making very, very little money, so some days it was a choice between who was gonna eat, me or the dog. And I took a trip to Ghana. And I was there during their Christmas break. And I remember the kids were so excited to see me. They didn't call me an African American, they called me a black American because I was from America. And one of the little boys, Richard, ran up to me and he said, Claudine, Claudine, are you here to teach us? And I said, yes. He said, very good. We are ready to learn. And they were. Every single day they showed up. When I was finished teaching them, I would have to get up early in the morning so they could get their lessons so then they could do their work. But then when they finished their chores, they came right to the volunteer house so that I could continue teaching them. And it made me realize that this was part of something bigger than me that I should, was supposed to be doing in the world. But when I came back home, I couldn't get enough teaching positions to stop me and the dog from having a fight over the last bite of whatever food it was. So I got a, a job again in, in corporate America, but this job was meant for me because the job description should have had my name on it. And I was placed with the best leader I'd ever had in my life. Pete Berg saw me for the talented individual that I am. He wasn't threatened by me. He didn't try to keep me in my place. He didn't try to make me small. He didn't want me to change who I am, and he didn't take credit for my work. He celebrated who I am, and we had fun together. He helped me see that I was the, a natural servant leader and a natural born teacher, and I was designed to do Lean Six Sigma work, which is process improvement. But part of what I had to do was coach employees and help them understand that they knew the process better than anybody else and that they had to trust that they could make the process better. And then I had to coach their leaders to accept that the people in the process might know the process better than you. And then we did great work for about three years, and then Pete and I got laid off. And a friend of mine called me and asked me if I would come home to lead a project that he had at his company. And so I left Chicago, and I went to Berkeley. I call Berkeley my dark period. Because when I came back to Berkeley, I, I knew that when I left the Bay Area, I was done with, this part of the, with that part of the country. And being back, I was living with friends. And even when there was a lot of people in the house, I felt alone. I was drinking a lot. And I had been drinking for years, and it got worse and worse. Whenever I got in a situation, it got worse and worse. And I remember feeling like I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. It felt like I had done all this work, and I had highs and lows and ups and downs. And I felt like when I was in those ups, that the, the next thing was going to reveal itself. And I think I thought I was supposed to have like this straight path. And I started contemplating suicide. <clears throat> my, my dog, Max, died. And a friend of mine helped me see that I had been in an emotionally abusive relationship, which was an eye opener to me. And I decided that I didn't want to be here anymore. I had had so many heartbreaks and so much disappointment and felt so discombobulated with why I was even here. And Monterey called. I thought, like I said, I was moving to Monterey to be closer to a client. But what I realize now is that I had to have that breakdown in, Monterey, in Berkeley so that I could have the breakthrough that I would have 
here in Monterey. Because shortly after I got here, George Floyd, COVID happened and George Floyd was murdered, and I asked what I could do. And the answer came back, love. And I thought, oh, okay. I was running around Monterey telling people I love them and all sorts of things, and it was like, no, that's not the love we're talking about. Deeper love. But I realized I could not be the love I wanted to see in the world until I loved myself. So I set out on this self-love journey. And it helped me see that all the experiences that I had 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 led me to that moment in time, that I could not help other people until I understood what it was like to go through that journey. I realized that I was a coach because I had been coaching, so I couldn't be surprised when people reached out to me all of a sudden for coaching. When I started getting speaking engagements, it was like something that I've done over the years, and it was something that I'd always wanted to do, but I felt like it was something I couldn't do because I didn't know how to do it. And now I'm doing it because it's the thing I'm supposed to be doing because I'm not chasing the money. So I will leave you with this. When Steve Jobs once said, you can't connect the dots of your life looking forward, you can only see them looking backward. And when I look back across the dots of my life, Los Angeles and my mother helped me get a foundation by giving me the guidance I needed to understand who I am at the end of the day. Oakland helped me find my consciousness and creativity and full self-expression. Chicago helped me with my personal growth and development. Like I said, I had to have that breakdown in Berkeley so I could have the breakthrough in Monterey and find my purpose. And so I want to leave you with this. We're all here for a purpose. Your, your goal every single day should be to wake up and look for reasons to be challenged, to grow, to have courage, to be love, and to be the love that you want to see in the world. How do I know it works? Because love is the only reason I'm still here. Thank you.